Okay, between Sex Trek and Strokemon, I've had my fill of porno movies for the past several weeks, so it's time to get back to some good quality Christian entertainment with absolutely zero suggestive titles whatsoever. Peach, you're my friend. I can't hate you. Are you fucking kidding me with that title? How is it that two non-porno films I've reviewed recently are Bushwhacked and The Buttercream Gang? And just look at this DVD that's so cheap that it's simply a still shot pulled from the movie. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. You want the terrifying VHS artwork. <laughs> Buttercream! What's this? Good kids, small town fun, and unconditional love for a struggling friend? Guys, help! The sun is stuck in my fucking tree! You may be wondering why I own this on both DVD and VHS. Would you pass up 50 cents for some hot butter on cream action? Plus, check this out. It comes with a better movie! I don't care which movie you give me, just make sure it's from Feature Films for Families. The Buttercream Gang is about the whitest town you've ever seen, whose star white kid joins a white gang and comes back to white town in white, white, white. This town is so white, Buttercream isn't just the name of their gang, it's the name of their disco. So let's open our asses and let the buttercreaming begin. That's not a real house. The Buttercream Gang of the title is a gang of young kids who help out their neighborhood. Their leader, Pete, is going off to Chicago, which they celebrate by giving him things that he totally couldn't buy anywhere in Chicago. This is a sad goodbye. My aunt's alone with two little boys. I gotta go help her out. I'm a buttercreamer, right? Yeah, yeah. you know it. <laughs> well, that's what your grinder profile says. But someone else is gonna have to be put in charge. As my last final act as president, I would like to nominate... Scott! To be president of the Buttercreamers. Why do you want to nominate me? Because you're the only one whose name I remember, Scott. Plus, you know the gang motto. Buttercreamers isn't just about helping people out or whatever. It's about having fun. And rubbing cottage cheese on our nipples. Lots of cottage cheese. You cannot convince me that this title isn't written with the tip of someone's dick. They're so embarrassed by this title that lead actor Jason Johnson doesn't even sound like a real name. Uh-oh, white socks in the back pocket. You know what that means. He's on his way to meet eight out men. So other than helping out around the community, what does being a buttercreamer mean? It means they hang out with five-year-old girls. Guys, if you really wanted to get into Barbie's Starlight Adventure, just pay for a ticket. That's what this guy did. Ooh, they live on the poor side of town, I see. Scott and Pete keep writing letters to each other constantly, like Pete is in the Civil War. You've only been gone a month, but it feels like a year. I really miss the fun we had together. <laughs> yeah, buttercreaming under the bleachers. Pete is in Chicago so he can live with his aunt and help her around the house. Hey Pete, that's great. You know, if your parents were alive, I think they'd be so proud of you. Why do you keep bringing that up in every conversation? It's really bumming me out. Unfortunately, the letters start getting scarce when Pete begins hanging out with the John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band gang. And as we all know, spend five minutes in Chicago and you will eventually join a gang and get arrested in an alley. And worse yet... It's a letter from your school. You've been expelled. Not for gang violence, but because you joined the Waist High Khakis Gang, the most embarrassing gang in Chicago. So Pete is sent back home to live with his grandfather in a town resided only by slices of Wonder Bread. Even the umpire is an ordained minister. Oh boy. 
Oh boy, yes, yes! Oh, yes! He reacts the same way when he's at home at night with a stack of Marilyn Chambers films and a tub of buttercream. And don't slap the kids on the ass. I'd join an inner city gang too if I had to hang out with these kids. You got the right ones, baby. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> 90s! But that's a little better than their previous slogan. Does anyone else remember Pepsi's slogan from World War II? You've got the right one, baby. Uh-huh. No, no. Uh-oh. There seems to be trouble afoot. It's the Widow Jenkins! She fell down again! Go. Ask Lassie! We're a little fucking busy here! And they're getting hit on by random girls off screen. the hell was that? Ugh. Netflix was right in not picking up the series lamer things. Okay, so go in the house and help out the old lady. You ready, Elden? Yeah, I'm ready. Come on, Lenny. Break open the fucking window! I don't think she'll care! After this unnecessary action sequence, it- oh no, she's dead. And I think I know who killed her. Finally. I thought the old bag would never kick off. Just kidding. She's fine. But who was peeping in on her to discover her laying down? Well, are you sure you're okay? Can we do anything else to help you? Well, <clears throat> I do need some things from the store, boys, if you have time. Uh, yeah, we were being polite. We got shit to do. Maybe now they can get away from questionable dialogue. No, we're just picking up some things for Mrs. Jenkins. Oh, I see. Buttercream business. <laughs> oh my god. Change that fucking name! Did I ever tell you boys that my great-grandfather was one of the first buttercreamers? He liked hanging out with older hairless men in steam rooms? Too much information! Why can't you kids be like the Hollywood Knights? At least they come with a rockin' soundtrack. They run into Pete's grandfather, who is a little standoffish. He just looked up the term buttercream in the Urban Dictionary. But unlike other buttercreamers, they're worried about the upcoming school dance. I just think he's afraid to dance with a girl. I'm not afraid. I'm just a little worried. What am I going to do if I'm out dancing with the girl and they start playing a slow song? Well, when that happens, you buttercream in your pants! The school nerdy girl is doing research on street gangs. Convenient. Speaking of, they find out that Pete is back. Hey guys, come on back. On time no see. What happened to you? I'm an actor in a series of Corona commercials, yo. Scott is thrown off because Pete is now instantly cooler than all of them. Ugh, this is the worst story to come out of Stars Hollow. I mean, he's stealing shoelaces for him. Fucking shoelaces! Scott knows that this is a crime against humanity. Yeah, well, where'd he get the money? I don't know. Maybe his grandpa gave it to him. That's just it. His grandpa doesn't have money for stuff like that. His grandpa can't afford shoelaces. Clearly, this can only mean one thing. I just want to borrow one of your reports. Well, which one did you want? I've tortured you with so many. The one you gave this morning on gangs? And this was Scott's first lesson in profiling. You know what? It's not like Scott is much better. Look at his scenes with Margaret. Sorry, Margaret. I didn't see you there. You didn't see me? What am I, invisible? Let's go to Pete's house. Sorry, Margaret. I didn't see you there. Why should today be any different? I'm not a delivery service, you know. If you want it now, you're going to have to walk over with me. Scott's a dick. He then confides in his father, Penzoil Foxworthy. I heard Pete turned some heads in town today with the way he was dressed and all. Yeah, the town has never seen bandanas that aren't in someone's back pocket. But like all the other movies like this, will the creepy music fit in somewhere? What's up, man? What are you doing here? I thought you said you were going to come over. Brought your bike back. It's a great bike. That's right. Thanks to Chicago, Pete's also a serial killer. I blame H.H. H. Holmes. Despite the creepy music, Scott and Pete do bond again. Picture this, all right? This old lady falls down and she says, I've fallen down and I can't get up. I mean, she's flipped over on her back like a turtle or something and she's just kicking and screaming going, I've fallen down and I can't get up. 
<laughs> Wait till he hears the one about the old lady saying, where's the beef? <laughs> Seriously, guys, the Widow Jenkins just died. Pete has gotten so bad, even the town's grade school girls want to spy on him. We'll call ourselves the Buttercreamettes, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. You call yourselves Switchblade Sisters like a real gang. Oops, no time to talk now. I feel a montage going on with surely catchy music. Looking back on a younger man long ago and far away. This town needs a leather bar like yesterday. God, the girls are stalking them like they're the fucking birds. While Pete's busy stealing shit, the boys are busy being suckers. Tom Sawyer tricked them into painting that fence. But even though Pete has a new gang, one thing is still true. Margaret, don't move. How'd you know we were here? Stop kidding, Alan. I'll tell you when you can talk. Pete is still more likable than all of you. Even when he and his gang are picking on Margaret themselves, she'll get him back by blowing him up at the prom. Only one person can be a dickhead to Margaret, and that's Scott. Hey, Pete, what's the big idea? We're just having some fun here, Scott. Yeah, well, maybe you should look the word fun up in the dictionary. Yeah, does fun look like this? Stop kidding, Alden. <clears throat> I'll tell you when you can talk. You and your friends are dicks, too. Since Scott is the hero Whitesboro deserves, she goes to the dance with Scott. Oh my god, no glasses! Damn! Unfortunately, they get lost and end up in a chainsaw massacre. I can't even imagine what this dance is gonna look like. Oh, they're doing a new dance. It's called the Lean Turkey on White with the crust cut off. Seriously, are there any minorities that live here? Or anyone from other countries? Alright, we're gonna slow things down a bit, right? So I want to see you with that uh, beautiful young lady or that handsome young man, alright? You're from Evanston! Cut that accent out! Scott is nervous because he doesn't know how to dance. Don't worry, no one else does either. How bad could he be? If these two get married, the term, is it in yet, is gonna come up a lot. Can we stick with Pete? His movie is way more interesting. <laughs> and the term, this has never happened to me before, is gonna come up a lot too. This is too far, so Scott challenges them to a fight. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock Swanson's Field, you better be there. You will. Just start saying your prayers. Yeah, you'll be toast when we get done with you. Yeah, burnt toast. And then the Buttercream Gang died. This town is serious about their fights, but only after church lets out, of course. And when the sermon is going on, why does it look like one of them is jerking off? Man, I can't believe I have to go to church. I want to kick someone's ass. Come on, guys. Why aren't you fighting? I know I shouldn't come to church today. Coach has to know about the fight. He was looking right at me. Nah, I heard him practice it last week. It doesn't matter. My mom told me God knows everything in advance. That's why you're not fighting. You're afraid God will tattle on you. Hell, Scott doesn't even show up. The other two literally bring a surrender flag. And Pete meets Scott somewhere else. I'm here, aren't I? I'm not afraid of you. Those jeans say that you're afraid of anything you can't catch with a fishing rod. So Scott challenges Pete to spend the day with him. And when he does, Scott brings his own montage. And then they bang. Hard. And Pete gets to hear about Scott's rough life. Maybe relax and forget all my worries. What worries? A championship game tomorrow. Oh my god, I didn't realize how terrible you had it. The real story of this is Pete's struggle to be the only good actor in this town. And the homoerotic dialogue. Because things change, right? People change. They don't have to. They already have. You won't understand. Sometimes I want so bad for things to be the way they were, but... Hey, they can't. 
Real friends accept each other for who they are. You're only willing to be my friend if I change. I'm not who I was, Scott. I am who I am. That's garbage. And then they bang again. Hard. Ooh, now we get to see Scott's rough championship game. And the announcer possibly talking about baseball. Those of you here in the ballpark will witness a tradition of this young catcher. In fact, he's famous for finding ways to keep everybody loose throughout the ball game. I have a feeling that half of this town is catchers, but at least the announcer is pointing out that it's up to someone to keep the people loose. Damn, Scott needs some real inspiration here. Maybe a little championship game tension in you the air. You got the right here. one, baby! Uh huh. You got the right one, baby! Uh huh. And with that, Ray Charles also became deaf. I'm not really getting a buttercream vibe from the crowd. More of a body lotions and baby oil vibe. Oh, look, Josh Cuervo showed up to heckle them. Or to listen to the announcer, who, again, I'm not entirely positive is talking about baseball. So this time they don't pitch to him, and the Sox left fielder is given an intentional base on ball. Things have really switched to the visitor's favor. Pitcher, catcher, sometimes you gotta switch to carry your weight in this town. But Scott is having none of Pete's taunts. I'm sorry, Scott. I wish there was something I could do. You can send him back to Chicago where he belongs! Hey, that's enough. Whoa! That is some deep dish racism, motherfucker! Although I can vouch for the fact that every time I go to Chicago, I as well join a gang. Good, the game is over. We can stop with the double entendres. Hey, Scott. You took a pretty good ribbing out there today, didn't you? Oh my god! Victor Salvo would say this movie's too much! I guess this is where we get advice from the minister. Did you know that uh, India was still ruled by... England until after World War II? Anyway... So do Pete and Scott become friends again? Don't ever talk to me that way again and don't you ever, ever, ever threaten me no, again. No, no, no. Take him in there! Uh-oh, Scott's about to take another ribbing. Those monsters, they flicked a little fake blood on his nose. The big showdown is Scott standing up to Pete and then walking away. Well, you did the right thing, son. I'm proud of you. But secretly, he's very disappointed. And then Dad starts talking about the war. Good segue. You know, I don't talk too much about the war, but I knew a soldier in Vietnam who always introduced himself by saying, uh, Hi, I'm Scott Paulson. I'm a Christian. He was killed five minutes later. What does that have to do with me, Dad? Life went on and I forgot all about him. Until the night you were born. Yeah, he thought of his one true love, which is maybe why his wife has no dialogue here. After Dad is done describing the plot to Faith of Our Fathers, Scott takes his advice and narks on Pete? Why didn't you do anything about it? Well, I thought about it, and I decided that a little love and patience is more important than a few pennies profit. Yeah, but you shouldn't let him steal from you, though. Oh, well, you're right. From now on, I'm just going to give him the treats. Mr. Graff's store shut down the following day once everyone heard about his everything is free sale. So now whenever Pete asks for something, they give it to him? Like Scott's bike? Is this movie gonna end with Pete becoming the mayor? He even gets free soda from the store. Downside, the other kids will try to force a game of football on him. Haha, <laughs> take that, I'll ruin your fucking flowers. At one point, they gather up all the papers Scott delivered and then drop them back off at Scott's house, which seems like a bigger pain in the ass for Pete than it does Scott. This kid's hair says, I auditioned to be the kid from Bingo, and his jeans say, check out my Jethro Tull collection. But Pete's master plan is to stage a robbery at his own home so he can get money to go back to Chicago. But the robber didn't plan on idiots. You were just thwarted by a gang who was once roundhouse kicked by the Babysitter's Club. How is Pete going to get the money now? Robbing the biggest sucker ever. Don't you get it, old man? You're being robbed here. Well, I know that's what you're trying to do. But if I give you the money, then you're not robbing me. Now, here's uh, 
$274. Is that enough? Huh, well, that settles that then. So long, you stupid town. This whole town is crazy. What's the matter with you people? Don't you got any brains in your head? You don't give somebody the money who's trying to rob you and say, well, now you're not robbing me. Dude, you got the money. Quit while you're ahead. Or destroy the place. The scene is like falling down if defense only had a so-so day. Beat storms out and somehow makes it back to Chicago anyway. Doesn't explain how. And Scott bombards him with more letters, even though they're not exactly sure where he is. Months and months go by, and since Scott is the most important person in this town, everyone gathers to give Scott the news of Pete's off-screen redemption. Pete has turned a new leaf and is back to being good again. But here's what they led with. It's about Pete. I just got a letter from his aunt today. I just want you to know, son, it doesn't always turn out this way. That's how you started this conversation? It sounded like Pete was dead. Everyone else in this town is a dick, too. And inappropriate. You got the right one, baby. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not now, Spaz. So that's what became of Pete. He started his own Chicago chapter of the Buttercream Gang. And then Pete was never heard from again. Because he died. You know how I know he's dead? Cause Pete didn't end up in Chicago at all. He ended up in Mulholland Drive. So it's back to awkward conversation for the group. Well, there's another change the Buttercreamers need to make. What's that? I think it's time for the Buttercreamers to have a grill member. We'd be able to help with a lot of things. Whoa, slow down. We're not that progressive. We'll let a violent gang member into our club, but not a girl. And just like a movie of this kind to end on a cliffhanger. It's the widow Jenkins! She fell down again! And just leave her on the ground. That's how she'll learn. And that's it. Happy music as they ride off to save an old woman from dying. Well, I hope you were paying attention because there's gonna be a quiz. Seriously, there's a quiz on the back of the box. You better hope you didn't get the DVD version. That one only has four questions. This one has five. Non-multiple choice. When someone wrongs you, does it take more courage to fight or to find another way to solve differences? Yes, fight! Kick the kid's ass! Does doing the right thing always bring immediate results we can see? Um, I'd prefer you not see me get a blowjob for my good deeds. When people don't like themselves, how do they usually treat others? By trolling other people on the internet and calling them a beta cuck! Why did Scott give Pete his bike? Because he's a sucker! What does unconditional love mean? <laughs> Deep anal. So the Buttercream Gang is a lesson in that no matter how well-intentioned or harmless your movie is, none of that will matter if you name your movie the Buttercream Gang. I'm just saying, there's a reason why Boys in the Hood wasn't called the Oral Train Cream Pie. And let's not forget that this all started because Pete dressed differently and then they got little girls to spy on him and no one seems at all concerned about the other troubled kids who are in Pete's gang. And I am not forgetting about the hard banging. And I'm not sure if eh, just give them what they want will end gang violence. And yes, one year later, there was a sequel titled The Buttercream Gang in Secret of Treasure Mountain. Spoiler alert, it's a bathhouse. Yeah, the treats are on me. One buttercreamer to another. <laughs>